couple of questions on Syria. Uh, yesterday, there's a um, drone attack to a U.S. base in northeast Syria, which resulted in um, one, dead, one death and six injured. Uh, after that, U.S. launched an airstrike, also killed 11 uh, people in, in Syria. Any reaction from the Secretary General on this incident? Oh, well, of course, we continue to be worried about all of the continuing tensions, uh, and, and we are trying to see what can be done uh, to lower the tensions from uh, different forces uh, uh, in Syria, and we'll continue with those efforts. Do you, do you not to urge everybody to respect the sovereignty and uh, territory integrity of Syria? Uh, well, of course, uh, that, that's, a, that's a given, and, uh, and obviously uh, it's important that the sovereignty and territorial of integrity of Syria is respected. <laughs> Uh, at the same time, uh, you're, you're aware of uh, the, the uh, complexity of the situation of foreign forces, but we call for them to exercise restraint. But do you think the presence of the U.S. military in Syria is, is illegal or not? Uh, that, that's not an issue that, uh, that uh, we're, we're dealing with at this stage. There's been a war. But uh, is that? Is that th there, because been, it, there's it sounds very familiar. This week we talk a lot about the UN Charter, the, 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 the international law, and relative resolutions. But it, it sounds to me a foreign, foreign presence, foreign military-based presence in another country without invitation sounds like, sounds like something else to me, you know. Uh, I'll, I'll leave your analysis to you. Uh, that the, there's, there's uh, at, at this stage. What's the what's the difference at, at between, stage, between th Syria, there's, there's no, the situation in Syria, and the situation in Ukraine? There's no U.S. armed forces inside mm -hmm. of Syria, uh, and so uh, so I don't have a. It, it's it's not uh, a you, parallel you, situation. You, you're to you're some sure of the others. there's no there's no U.S. U.S. military personnel. I, I believe there's military activity. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, but uh, in terms of ground presence in Syria, I'm not aware of that. Okay, five U.S. service members were injured in that attack. If there's no, there were no U.S. soldier service members in Syria, how could they got injured? Uh, That's weird, right? Should I ask yeah. you about that? Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Syrian Analysis. I'm your host, Kirk Almasyan. I've been following the Syrian war and reporting for you as well for quite uh, some time. But uh, I believe uh, one of the most surreal exchanges that I have seen at the UN was between uh, journalist Edward Chu and the spokesperson of, for the UN, Farhan Haq, uh, which was about the uh, question was about the US forces in Syria, whether they are legal, they are stationing in Syria, what are they doing here in the country, and the drawing parallels between the Syrian case and the Ukrainian case, because according to the UN, the presence of the Russian forces are illegal in Ukraine. So the question is, what are the American forces doing in Syria? And for that, I have hosted today Edward Chu. He works for the China Central Television. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Edward, for accepting my invitation. It's a pleasure to have you on my channel and also listening to your uh, perspective of what happened because there is only this one-minute clip, right, on social media platforms that have been circulated all the time on, on, on these platforms. Hi, uh, Mr. Bassian. Hope I pronounced correctly. Yeah. Uh, so the honor is mine to be here with you and everybody else. Um, actually, that that is a very very uh, unexpected um, processing. I would put it that way because I never expected Mr. Hawk would answer my question mm -hmm. that way. Uh, I I kn but somehow I knew that he's not going to um, dig too much into into the legality of the presence of United States in Syria. I know he would avoid that question, but uh, I never expected he's trying. To, he's trying to, how to say that, 
You you could you could say make up something, but he's actually said I'm not aware of, which means I don't know.、Uh, you know, by that way, I actually I try I try to drag him out. I said, "Are you sure?" But he he insisted that that's why I started everything.、Um, yeah, but but that day it's quite surreal that he made some announcement that like that. Just like yesterday, the Russian ambassador to the United Nations, Nebenzia. Uh, in his、uh, Security Council presidency、uh, briefing, when he answered the question about Syria, also about Syria, he said he he, he even mentioned that he said he said I I how 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 should I comment that? Let me put it dem-、uh, diplomatically, and he said, okay, I'm not going to I'm I'm refraining myself from commenting from of that. So yeah, I think. It's it's、uh, at least it's not it's not good for the image of of the United exactly, Nations. Exactly, but、That's、did you expect、true. this big backlash on social media platforms? I mean,、uh, that day when I logged in into Twitter, especially on Twitter, it's like when I'm、uh-huh. I, when I'm when I'm surfing in my timeline, your video is coming like on all major influencers' pages. You know the the, the thing the thing is, I expected some kind of、uh, some kind of heat online. It it actually went 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 viral in China first, and then some people posted on Twitter, and that's why it got exploded、uh, globally.、Uh, but from my point of view, well, let's face the facts. We know that Syrian crisis lasted over twelve years, but frankly speaking, so far or currently, how many people are really ca- caring about Syrian crisis? That's the thing. So I never expected it could. Blow like that, but I I I suspect some kind of 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 heat or 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 attention from the internet. Actually,、um, on on Twitter especially,、uh, since the takeover、mm. of、uh, Elon Musk of the platform, I'm seeing more voices critical to the U.S. foreign policy, and in particular on Twitter. And it's mostly coming、mm-hmm. from the conservative sides. And now the conservatives they always prioritize China as an enemy、uh, versus uh, uh, Russia. The Democrats are more、mm-hmm. like bulldogging against Russia, and the、uh, and and the conservatives are trying to、uh, minimize, let's say, the military assistance to Ukraine. But in exchange, I mean, both are the same for me. But they just have priority、uh, in their in the image who they think the enemy is. And now because、mm-hmm. of the Ukraine war. Uh, everybody is asking the question: Why the United States is giving all this assistance from our tax money? And then the earthquake hit Syria, and people realize that there is also sanctions imposed on、uh, other countries. So the Syrian file is now being revived among, I would say, the conservatives, but also the anti-war Americans in the United States, who every time the U.S. administration says that the Russia invaded Ukraine, it's illegal, then they say, then what about、uh, Syria? What are you doing in Syria? Aren't you plundering the Syrian oil there? I mean, it's been said, for example, by、uh, Donald Trump, for example, himself. He said that we, our troops in Syria, is to steal the oil.、Uh, the U.S. itself, the Pentagon, they confessed that they have troops in, in Syria, contractors, and also they trained some proxies there to operate、uh, alongside the U.S. forces. Now. The Americans themselves saying we are in Syria. So what's the point of denying the presence of U.S. forces in Syria by the U.N. official? Do you think he is misinformed well, or worse, is he biased? Now the thing, the thing is, when you're talking to the U.N., let, let's let's first dig a little bit, little bit deeper on this because I was here for three years.、Uh, for the lap, for the past year, one year, actually, I I. Participate this、uh, noon briefing constantly, like daily almost. So what I discovered is that、uh, UN is actually first. They they are they are striving for their own survival, which means they have to strike balance between c- different countries. So you can tell which countries are the most important、mm-hmm. ones. That's why when 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 some topics, hot topics concerning these countries, UN. Almost every single time, they are refraining themselves from condemning or commenting on those issues. Let me give you some example: Syria, the presence of United States in Syria. That's one thing. The other thing, the seven billion frozen assets of Afghanistan. You see, that's also concerning United、wow. States. And also, if we're talking about 
Palestinian and uh, Israeli um, Israel uh, the conflict, you can hear the UN condemn the what they called attacks from Palestinian side or Palestinian militants. But if you're talking about Israeli military, they would say the Secretary General expressed concerns. So you can tell the difference. And also, I have to, I, I'm very frank about this. Also on China, if you're talking about, let's say, Taiwan problem, which of course I, I consider Taiwan part of China. But if you're talking about that, the the UN also is very quite quite uh, restrain him themselves from answering mm -hmm. those questions. So you can tell that UN, in some degree, at some degree, they are actually trying to get their own survival while to put more efforts on what they can do. That's why they don't want to answer those questions. So back to the question you asked: Does has has far has Farhan got mis, uh, misinformation or something? I don't think so. But it's like a spontaneous response. But this time the spontaneous response is not that accurate. So yeah, that's you know that's the hazard to to be a spokesperson. Sometimes you say something wrong. Sometimes it could be very yeah. wrong. And this is the time that it could I want to mention wrong. an example that happened with me in 2014. I was in Beirut working there and I applied for a job at the UN in, in Beirut. And uh, I got an, uh, went to a job interview and uh, my direct manager or boss, uh, he knows me from online. And he told me, Kev, if you want to work with us, you have to close your Facebook account. Like, it's not possible for you to give commentaries on Facebook and then work at the UN. And I said, uh, okay, uh, I can understand that. Because he said you have to be like this, I remember, objective. He, he, he did like this, you have to be objective. And I said, I understand that, uh, but I have a question. Like, I know uh, another Syrian person works in the same um, office in the same office in the UN here in, in Beirut and he has a Facebook account and he's uh, very much active and writing against the Syrian government. I don't understand why he can write and not me. If he, both of us aren't, aren't writing about this case, that would be fair, right? You want to keep your neutrality. But even back then, I realized that, uh, yeah, there are some opinions aren't as welcomed as other opinions, even in the UN itself. Well, uh, I think I think if if we if we take a look at the history of the United Nations, how how UN was formed, you would discover something. This basically this this very institution is based on the political system of West what what we call Western democracies, right? So we got uh, the um, legislative branch, which is the General Assembly. We have the Secretariat, which is basically administration, and we have. I, ICJ, uh, International Court of Justice, which is the Supreme Court. So you see, they have some similarity between the, demo the, the Western democracies, political systems, and the UN. So when we when we talk about all those values, the shared values they have, um, more or less, it, the UN is naturally influenced by by Western cultures. So yeah, I, I so, so yes, th this is why I said I understand some of those those moves the UN has made because some sometimes when, when UN started to say something very uh, quite liberal, I mean the liberal um, the liberal movement, you will understand because they are from the you know the Western political system. That's that's what they do. And also the most influential contributors of the United Nations are are from from western countries i would say that i would put it that way um you know the three i always i asked actually i asked the spokesperson about this i said what 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 are the three pillars of un human rights peace and stability and another one is development so if you look at the un so far if you look at look at the un nowadays they they emphasize uh, human rights quite a lot they emphasize peace and stability a lot. Development, they have SDG, but the SDG, according to what the Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres said, it's in ICU. Mm. So, yeah. So, but if you put these three different branches into, into all the countries, basically you will discover something interesting because 
if you're talking about the political side, it, it's always been controlled by, by United States appointed officials in the UN. If you're talking about humanitarian side, it's by the mm. UK. If you're talking about development, it's by China. So you can tell this system, um, the UN system has its own, how to say that, it reflects the current political, um, uh, a geopolitical status, yeah. I would say. And also, it, it like I said, it struggles for its own survival. That's why it has to balance everything very, very carefully. And that's why they they are leaning to Western powers. That's why actually the other day I asked about about the the the, the meaning of the UN now nowadays. I asked directly to Secretary General Antonio Guterres. This is what he said. He said, if you're talking about some particular, some particular institutions in the United Nations, especially Security Council, the UN nowadays, the, yes, he admit there's problem. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're talking about humanitarian, you know, if you're talking about humanitarian, like how, how, how to hand out all those humanitarian assistance, he think UN is still the most capable agencies in the world. So yeah, I would say that UN in different in different uh, institutions, different branches, they have different uh, functions. Some of them are yeah working, but some of them are mm -hmm. eh, because of the geopolitical mm -hmm. tensions. You can tell what what it looked like. And another interesting thing is, have you ever wondered how the Security Council works during the Cold War? Have you ever wondered that? Because the other day I asked a very prestigious uh, correspondent who's been here for over 27 mm -hmm. years. I asked her, I said, I said, Edie, Edie, can you tell me how the Security Council works during Cold War? Because we saw the past few years how the Security Council is unable to work. And she said, basically, the Security Council can do nothing during Cold yep. War. She reminded me, she said, all those UN peacekeeping missions, basically, they are proved after 1991. And guess why? That's because that's the time when the Cold War ended. So, yeah, I was like, I, I was struck by this answer. I was like, yeah, maybe nowadays the, the UN, especially the Security Council, is back to normal because we have like 30 years of abnormal. I mean, uh, nowadays there are so many examples like the UNDOF forces or uh, UNIFIL forces in Syria and in Lebanon, so many question marks why they are only stationed on the Syrian and the Lebanese side and not on the Israeli side and what are they doing there. And during the uh, conflict uh, near the borders with the uh, Golan Heights, uh, uh, what were they doing when the Israeli side was providing assistance to the Islamist groups and the, which were on the list of the UN's list of the terrorist groups, right? Let, let, let me try to answer that question from from the spokesperson. They will say they would say that they have no they have no information that Israel is providing assistance to those Islamic mm -hmm. militants. Yeah, I would I would mm -hmm. I would believe that would be the answer. Uh, although Israel Israeli support is uh, uh, undeniable uh, during between 2016 and 2018, and those were various groups, including ISIS and Nusra and um, the Free Syrian Army on the borders. They received cash and they were treated going into the occupied Golan Heights. But uh, my, my, my concern is not only about the official uh, narrative, right? I'm also concerned about mm -hmm. the journalists uh, who do not ask the hard questions. And in, in your opinion, for example, like I was, I was following lots of press conferences in the UN, but I haven't seen the journalists asking the hard questions in the UN. Why do you think is that? Are the journalists also misinformed or are they not interested in asking hard questions and digging into the truth? Because there are multiple truths, right? And uh, each side can have its mm -hmm. truth, but at least as a journalist, you need to ask for both sides of the, uh, of the story. Well, I think well, I think first of all, uh, my me and my colleagues sometimes we did ask harsh questions, difficult questions, um, be, because some of some of those questions basically you got zero information. You know, just like I said, you you can expect what their answer would be. Uh, in that case, there's no meaning of reporting this from uh, from our point of view because there's no information. Mm -hmm. 
we asked, we tried, but they didn't answer anything. So basically it's like, yeah, there's no value about that question. Um, that's one of the reasons you, you could not see this. And secondly, um, well, from, from my understanding, uh, well, there there is always a uh, so, sorry. There is always a correspondent called Abd Hamid yep. uh, from Palestine asking yep. uh, asking the Palestine Israel questions, which also got Israel, I think, quite pissed off. Uh, that's very very harsh questions. Um, but from other from uh, from from the other point of view, um, I think it's because you know, for example, the. The, the the Ukrainian conflict, you don't really have that many people asking question to 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 ask questions to really how to say that to 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 talk about the other side. Like everybody's asking about Russian, about you know how how they invade Ukraine, but when it comes to the other side, when you're asking about how when you're asking about how how the Ukrainian forces you know, spread minds. That's not me, my word. That's actually from from the human human rights uh, uh, um, the group. Mm -hmm. Their reports. They said the Ukrainian forces actually sometimes they they spread uh, spread paddle what they call paddle mines. So that causes casualties of the civilians. So yeah, because you don't you don't really have that many reporters to ask this type of questions, um, and. And from my point of view, I feel like, well, I ask both sides questions, frankly speaking, because I feel like sometimes you have to be balanced. Uh, my way of being balanced is not to ask balanced questions, but to ask questions from both yeah. sides, which is quite interesting, actually. Um, and and speaking of the correspondence there, I can, I can give you an example. Um, I'm not going to tell you which agency this, um, this, this correspondent is working for. But the other day we had an ex we had an exchange on the situation in Syria. Um, she's uh, she's very upset that um, after a week, the human the, the, the so called cross border humanitarian corridor opened by uh, with the permission from the president Bashar al Assad, and she's like she's like she he she said the president president just playing a good man. It's not it's not true. Why? She believe it's just a gesture because seven days after the earthquake, everybody who died, they have, they have already passed away. So there's no use for those cross-border uh, humanitarian corridors. And then I, I, I said, I said but, but somehow this is like, a, if you put it this way, this is about solve solving decision, right? I said it's a sovereign decision. You have to let them agree, but this also gives you a chance to see see some of those things like cross border humanitarian corridors. They are they 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 do not need the permission from Security Council. The Syrians could decide whether they can open it or not. And she's like, nevertheless, if these 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 corridors can save people's life. The earthquake has already done the things for Bashar al-Assad, which is to kill people. Wow. That's what they feel. And I, I got, I got, I, w I would tell you the truth that I got a little bit pissed off because I stayed there for three years. I, I told, I told her, I said, if you're talking like that, let's bear this in mind, that if there are people, there were people died in Idlib in northwest um, Syria. There were also people died in Aleppo, right? I mean, that's the, that's what they call regime controlled yeah. or government controlled area. And she's like, nevertheless, Bashar should step away like a decade ago. Mm. Then everything would not happen. Why would she even have a say about that as a foreign journalist on Syria? <laughs> this is the question that, that always goes in my mind. That day, that day, because that day, where we're, there's there, there's <laughs> the, there's this gossip that the Security Council could might discuss a, a an extension of this two extra humanitarian corridor, cross border corridor. That's why we're having hmm. this we were having this dialogue, and she said, 
the president should go should should go away like a decade ago. So everything else would not happen. This is something and I want to just jump in and say something here. People need yeah, to understand okay. now the difference of mentalities. There is intellectual imperialism. These people are infected the, with inte- what, what, what? Well, what I want to tell you is, I believe she believed every single word yeah. she said. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's because the, because the they're thing. really infected with intellectual imperialism, and I want to stress on this: there is the feeling and the conviction of superiority mm-hmm. from these people over the people in the Middle East, Africa, Asian countries. That we know what is best for you. We know if Bashar al-Assad is good for you or not, and we think it's not, it's bad, and we think he has to go. And they, they are destroying the sole concept of democracy, which is the people in Syria have to choose their president. But despite that, they still intervene. And the difference between these people, and I'm sure uh, she or he is from a Western mainstream uh, outlet, she. but if you compare yeah. it with the Chinese and the Russian uh, journalists or even activists, right? The, the, the things that Russia is doing nowadays in Ukraine, there are so many people in Syria itself or in Africa, they would disagree with Russia. Mm. However, they also say for decades, nobody cared about our human rights when we were smashed under American uh, hegemony, right? And at the same time, they see the difference of handling the treatment from the Chinese and from the Russian side. I, I was I was mm. watching at least four or five videos of African leaders uh, on YouTube, mm-hmm. uh, although I probably disagree with them in their internal politics, but they are saying to the Americans that we want to deal with China. You have an mm. obsession from China. We don't have that. The Chinese come here to us, invest, respect our uh, sovereignty, respect our choices, the values, and the way of life. The Americans, when they come and invest somewhere, they come with a political project with them, with sets of ideas. They have pre- pre- yeah, pre-tests. Like I, I met a, a delegation from uh, Tajikistan here in, uh, in Berlin, mm-hmm. and uh, they were meeting with a conservative uh, political party, and I was documenting it. And I heard them talking and uh, saying, why do you guys, every time you come, the Germans in Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, these countries, to invest, you tell us that we have to improve our uh, status of women. We have to bring more women into positions of power. You talk about feminism. You talk about LGBTQ rights, etc., etc. Why do you even care how do we handle our societies? You're coming here to invest. Let's talk business. Why do you, every time we're talking about business, you bring with us your own ideology? We do not accept that. And the entire world is now waking up and also feeling that there are powers that they can rely on and that is China and Russia. Like, just go back one year, back now, were these African leaders able to say what they're saying now with great confidence and telling them uh, to the Americans, you cannot teach us about democracy. You have caused enough havoc in our continent and we don't accept that and now we have other reliable partners to rely on. Hmm. Uh, I remember last last year when, when the Indian foreign minister traveled to Europe he told his European counterparts that don't think the problem of Europe is the problem of the world. Of course, he is referring to the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, that's quite the mindset, I think, from some of the Western countries, some Western journalists. They feel like that, well, that's the world. Europe, America, that's all. So, but basically, they forgot there's Middle East, there's Africa, there's South, uh, there, there, there's Afri- um, there's Latin America, and there's South Southeast Asia, South Asia, and you know, Eastern Asia. They 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 just pretend or or they just simply ignore the, those places. It's hilarious, uh, really. I I will end up this conversation with you with a question, uh, Edward, with the apparent uh, shift in the global balance of power after the Ukraine war and the emergence Mm -hmm. of Russia and China as superpowers. Do you expect fairer treatment of the people in the global South and Asia through the institutions of the UN or probably we're seeing um, the demise of the UN, such as the League of Nations uh, just before or after the war? Put it simple, no. I'm so sorry to answer you like that. But 
Yeah, that's the situation. Actually, I asked I asked the Secretary General this. I said, if UN could not treat things fairly, when 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 I talk about the human uh, uh, human rights office, the UN uh, HR uh, high uh, yeah I forgot the the High Commissioner of Human UNHCR. Human Rights Office. Yeah, I I told I told the Secretary General. I said I said. If you are not, if you are politicizing the the human rights issue, the humanitarian issue, how would developing countries look up to UN to seek for justice? And of course, he's he's in defense of the UN, but basically that's that's the case. So. Uh, you can feel from from our from from us in the headquarters. We we could feel the some of the tensions, not the tension, the pressures actually uh, from the developed world to some of the developing countries. It's like you remember the the, the G A. They passed the resolution on Ukraine. It 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 passed with flying colors with one, more than one hundred forty countries in support of the resolution. Uh, this February, right? Uh, but if you if you discuss with some of those representatives, you will you will figure that they somehow you know they have different level of words on that. So some of them receive pressure from Western countries. Some of them think it's a gesture to pass that resolution. But how to solve it? That's a problem. They might have some other yeah. thoughts. For example, Hungary. So yeah. So basically, you can tell that. Um, well, for UN, we're, we're joking. We have a we have a joke in China um, that if there if if the, the UN is is set for big powers to really managing the world. So if there's consequent there's there's tensions between big superpowers or big powers, especially P five. Um, there's little the UN can do but urging to de-escalate tensions, yeah. and so the joke from the ch the Chinese the Chinese web internet is, you know what? If two small countries have problems, UN intervened, the problems disappear. Yeah. If one big power and one small country have problems, the UN intervened, the small country disappears. <laughs> If two big powers have problems and UN intervene, the UN disappears. Yes. <laughs> that's how it works. I think that's an amazing, um, um, I would say in German we say Witz, it's a joke. And um, yeah. it, it, it's, it's uh, ironic but true. Edward, thank you really for your time that you dedicated for me and for the audience of Syrian Analysis. I'm sure that they appreciate your um, uh, insight. You work uh, at the UN for the China Central Television and you're reporting on this. I will keep following also your press conferences and uh, when you're asking questions, maybe we, we uh, find uh, more controversial uh, statements from, from the UN. We will follow this case because... Hopefully not. Hopefully not, of course, but uh, for us <laughs> as, as journalists, yeah. to be honest, with you, I care about my country, and I would like also to uh, urge the UN officials to do more on on this case. And I truly believe also social pressure sometimes uh, work uh, in this regard. So let's hope that the UN would be fairer uh, uh, for for the people of Syria and all the oppressed people around the world. Edward, thank you so much again. Thank you. And Thank you for and guys, you. thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you're new, please uh, subscribe and hit the like button and share this video with your friends. And if you want to support my independent work, you can become a patron. Link in the description below. And see you next time.